Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, the Lord our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Rublev icon and the doctrine of the Trinity itself confronts us with some of the most profound questions we will ever face. Who is God? How does God engage with his creation, the inanimate creation, humankind, us as individuals? And the very first chapter of the Bible tells us that humankind was made in the image of God. So what are the implications for humankind? Or to put it another way, how then shall we live? For Christians, the answer to the question, who is God, is that God is a unity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That there is one God in three persons, as the Western Church, Catholic and Protestant tends to put it, or three persons in one God, as the Eastern Orthodox Church puts it. In his farewell discourse, John chapters 14 to 16, Jesus describes at length the relationships between himself and the Father, between them and the Holy Spirit, and between them and us. He stresses their intimacy and that they work in concert. God is personal and relational, something that the Rublev icon captures. The three figures are neither masculine nor feminine, for gender is not a property of the Godhead, but they are personal. They are identical figures, but have different accoutrements, reflecting the fact that although the three persons are truly and equally divine, each has their own particular role. Moreover, the persons of the Godhead are intimately related. Notice not only the circle in which they are positioned, but also their gaze, which is focused on each other. They work as a unity. Orthodox theologian John Zizioulis wrote an influential book with the enigmatic title Being as Communion. Amongst other things, what he was driving at is that God's being consists of the common fellowship or communion of the three divine persons. The Father is the figure on the left. The figure on the right, with their hand beckoning towards the empty space, is the Holy Spirit. The central figure is the Son, who took human flesh as Jesus of Nazareth. In front of the Son, Jesus, we can see what look like the items we use when celebrating the Eucharist or communion reminding us of the centrality to our faith, of Christ's saving death on the cross. Whilst well, Christ is indeed central to our Christian faith, Rublo shows us that if we enter that open space at the front of the table, we enter into a relationship not only with Christ, but also with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Moreover, we can only fully grasp who Jesus truly is if we consider that in the light of his relationship to the Father and the Holy Spirit. How does God engage with his creation, more specifically with us human beings? What did you make of the open space at the front of the icon? This is an invitation to the viewer to enter and participate in the life of God. In other words, the Godhead is not closed in on God's self, but invites us, humankind, 
to share in, to participate in God's life. Whereas the Western tradition, Protestant or Catholic, tends to see salvation, being saved by God, in terms of the curing or dealing with the consequences of sin, the Orthodox perspective sees salvation more in terms of drawing the believer into the life of the Godhead, seeing the Christian life as a participation in the life of God. I've come to see participation as a key concept. These perspectives are not mutually exclusive. Biblical support can be found for both of them. The Holy Spirit, the figure on the right, by their hand gesture, beckons us to enter into that space. And some people also feel that the Holy Spirit's glance is focused on that space. In other words, the Holy Spirit has a key role in bringing about a saving relationship with God and living in fellowship with God. The Christian writer Henri Nouon wrote this. We must give our attention to that open space because it is the place to which the spirit points and where we become included in the divine circle. St. Paul wrote of the experience of human salvation. In Romans 8, mentioning all three members of the Godhead and spelling out the key role of the Holy Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So this icon helps us to explore who God is and reminds us of the invitation to come and share in the life of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One God. How then shall we live? That God is a relational unity in turn has implications for our relationships with others. When the Lord creates humankind, he says in Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. Notice the word our rather than my. It implies diversity within the Godhead. Fellowship, communion, not splendid autonomous isolation, must therefore be paramount values for Christians who take seriously the Trinitarian nature of God. Basing himself on his understanding of the nature of God, Zizioulis argued that to be means to be in relation to others. This fundamentally challenges individualistic conceptions of personhood, which start with the individual as, a, as an enclosed self and only then move to social relationships. Furthermore, in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, having prayed for his first disciples with those with him at the Last Supper, Jesus goes on to pray for the disciples of future ages. Those who will believe in me through their, the first disciples' message. In other words, people like us. This prayer in John 17, verse 21, is that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus has repeatedly emphasized the intimate fellowship between himself and his heavenly father, and he prays that our relationship as Christians be modelled on that. If this is the kind of God we worship, 
it challenges those who call themselves Christians, but seeing themselves as autonomous individuals, attach little value to church, to intimacy with fellow believers, or to ecumenical relations. The Trinitarian nature of God challenges to the core the rampant individualism of our Western culture that has so deeply affected, or we might say infected, the church. The current coronavirus crisis is impressing on the whole of humankind that we cannot continue to function as autonomous individuals or even autonomous nation states solely accountable to ourselves. That our health and our very lives depend on acting according to our shared humanity. Nearly 400 years ago, the then, the then Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral wrote some very famous words that I found moving and pertinent in our present context. He wrote this in a meditation. I speak of the metaphysical poet John Donne, who wrote that no man is an island He meant that no one is truly self-sufficient, but everyone must rely on the fellowship and comfort of others in order to thrive, and possibly, we might add, even to live. A blessing I have experienced, one I believe that many others have enjoyed too, is the greater efforts made by relatives, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ simply to communicate more, to express the value of relationships more. Engaging with the God who is the Trinity, a community of relationships, not only speaks to us powerfully about God, but also sets before us a vision of life together, both within the community of faith and beyond. 